Hey, let's go, man, from the start, man. Yeah. Let's jump on these fools from the start, man. All three phases. Yeah. Let's get out to these fools tonight. Yeah. Hey, win all three. One, two, three. Win. You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to a victorious edition of the Huddle Up Podcast presented by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me, as always, my partner in crime in this podcasting endeavor, he is your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we talked about it briefly right before we jumped on air here, but I don't know, man. Hell must have frozen over because the Broncos came out guns hot and just laid a beat down on Josh Rosen and the Arizona Cardinals. That is one way to snap a four-game losing streak, win by 35 points, and so convincing like that. It was uh, definitely, I would say, the best game of the Vance Joseph era, and I know it's not a long tenured history, with respect to that Week 2 win last year over the Cowboys. Yep. I, in every phase of the game, they were just dominant, so it was very encouraging to see. Absolutely. It was exactly what the doctor ordered at this point in the season, coming off four straight losses, and we're going to dive into what it all means today. We're going to keep this podcast because it's really late, especially we're recording this just a few minutes after the game ended. It's really late, especially for for Zach, but we're going to grind through this for you guys, muscle through it because we love you and we got to share some knowledge. We got to drop some knowledge is probably the better way to say it and talk about the implications coming out of this game and exactly what it all means. But before we do that really quick, make sure you guys are following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. Take some time, get that done. And if you've never left a review or a rating for the show on iTunes or Stitcher, take some time and get that done. You guys have no idea how much that helps us to grow and reach new listeners uh, each and every week. So take some time, knock that out for us. And one last piece of business before we dive in, we got to say thank you to a sponsor of today's show, Audible. You guys go out and get yourselves a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash huddle up. There's over 180,000 different titles that you get to choose from, whether you're on an iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. It's something I use literally every single day. I'm going on a four- or five-hour car ride over the weekend. You can count on the fact that I'm going to be listening to Audible because I love reading, but I don't always have time to sit down and turn the the pages on the books that I want to read. But Audible allows me to get these books under my belt, while I'm doing other things like commuting at the gym, in the kitchen, in the yard, whatever it might be. So you love listening to podcasts. You love the audio medium. You're going to love Audible. And we're giving you a chance, or I should say Audible's giving you a chance, to get a 30-day free trial and a free book if you go to audibletrial.com slash huddle up. Take care of that. All right, so Denver Broncos, 45, Arizona Cardinals, 10. This was a game, Zach, you know, we'll get to implications here in just a minute, but just to touch on some of the events that occurred Thursday night, this was a game that really lurched into Denver's favor right out of the gates on Arizona's opening possession. Derek Wolf tipped a pass. Todd Davis picked it off, returned it to the house, which ended up being one of two defensive touchdowns for the Denver Broncos. It was almost four, actually, because Brandon Marshall returned one that ended up being called an incomplete pass by Uh, Josh Rosen, and then even Von Miller on his strip sack that he recovered, he had a shot to return that. He was deep in Arizona's territory. He had a shot to return that. So this could have even been an even more brutal beatdown on the Arizona Cardinals than it turned out to be. This was a, a throwback to the the elite, you know, game wrecking Broncos defensive years past. We haven't seen this in a while from them. And the best medicine for a reeling defense is a rookie quarterback. Josh Rosen has tools and he has upside, but behind that Cardinals offensive line with Mike McCoy as the offensive coordinator and Broncos fans know how how bad he is. It, it was the best thing that could have happened for them. They were pissed off coming into this week. You heard Von Miller's comments, and he wrote. His mouth wrote a check that his butt cashed. And that's the best way I think you can put it. And the Broncos' defense stepped up. They finally played angry. They didn't just talk. They walked the walk also. And 
for, from the, like you said, the opening whistle, I mean, the second, third play of the game it was, whatever, you get that pick six and you give the Broncos offense a lead. You give some positive momentum. You build some momentum going forward. And when you give Von Miller an advantage, you allow him to do what he does best. It forces the opponents to start passing. And when they start passing, it's more opportunity for Von Miller to get after the quarterback. It's exactly what you saw. This is the recipe to success for Denver. Um, You know, it's not the greatest competition. You can't put too much stock into beating the Cardinals. I've said this multiple times on Twitter, but a win is a win is a win in the NFL. You never apologize for them. And anytime you get a 35 point victory keyed by multiple scores on defense, you cannot, you know, sneeze at that at all. Well, I mean, we knew when we saw the Cardinals next up on the schedule coming out of that disappointing Rams loss that this was going to be. Ideally, this was a get-right game for the Denver Broncos. I mean, this was yes. as juicy an opportunity for a, a reeling team like Denver coming off four straight losses as you can get. But just based on what we saw last year and the nature of this four-game losing streak that the Broncos had been mired in, I think most of us still, and especially seeing what happened to Denver on the road against a different rookie quarterback in Week 5, I think a lot of us were kind of unsure, really, exactly how to see or call this game. But when Von Miller went out on a a limb, so to speak, and called his shot like Babe Ruth at the plate pointing to left field, I mean, that's when I knew, you know, it might not be pretty, but the Broncos were going to win this game because, you know, it was a a key leadership type of moment for Von Miller, and we haven't seen a lot of that type of, hold on, guys, I'm going to step in front of oncoming traffic for y'all, and I'm going to take care of this. And it really galvanized the Denver Broncos. And, after this game in the locker room, now, again, we're recording this very shortly after the game uh, ended, but from what I've seen already from some of the uh, the sound bites and some of the quotes coming out of the Broncos locker room, that really did resonate but what Von Miller said with his teammates, and it galvanized him. They rallied. I mean, look across the board. I mean, what was the biggest difference? 45-10, 35-point margin. What was the biggest difference between this win? I mean, one handily. I can think of two or three other games in the Vance Joseph era. Uh, well, really two other games in which the Broncos won handily. The Dallas game and then the Jets game last year. Now this one. And what was the biggest difference? I mean, the Broncos, this wasn't the first game they won this year. They won their first two games, had to come from behind in both their first two victories to win. Close margins, but they came from behind. They got it done. What was the biggest difference? Let's say between the team of the last four games, the, the losing streak, and this team. And, you know, Vance Joseph, he talked about it, Zach, in the week leading up to this game, or the days, I should say, leading up to this game. wasn't quite a full week. But he talked about how, and he kind of tied it to tackling, Denver's rushing issues, defense, uh, tied it to tackling, that it's a mindset and that it's a want to. I think this team wanted this really, really badly. I mean, they came out with great intensity, great physicality, they played with a lot of juice, And one thing it tells me, Zach, is that this locker room, I mean, I think we all were questioning it, but I I believe this locker room is still fighting for their head coach. I think they're doing what they can, putting in the work, saying, look, we know our guy's on the hot seat, but we're not going to let him go down without all of us swinging. Yeah, you nailed it when you said they wanted this game. And from the opening whistle, they exerted their will. And we haven't seen that in a while. They came out on the field today and knew before the game even started that they would beat the Arizona Cardinals. And when you have that sort of confidence, it's an, it's infectious. It spreads throughout the entire team. And instead of playing timid or scared or tentative, they came out and were creative on both sides of the ball. They were well-disciplined for once. No, not many penalties, not a lot of turnovers, not a lot of stupid you know, self-inflicted wounds, so to speak. They play with creativity, swagger, intensity, passion. These are all the adjectives that were lacking, even in their wins the first couple weeks of the season when they squeak by a couple of substandard teams. This was a true, uh, you know, season-defining victory. I don't want to use that sort of um, hyperbole because it's a very lackluster opponent, sure. but th- this is what you want to see. This is something you can build on going forward. This is a momentum booster. And like you said, they want to fight for Vance Joseph because not only do they like their co- – he's a player's coach. He instills that kind of environment, but it also reflects on them. 
they're also looking out for themselves, too, because John Elway, they know that he'll make massive changes. No one's really safe, maybe except for Von Miller. So they want to come out and they want to prove. And I think that comment by Elway, they took it personally again, just like last year when Elway called them soft. That, that was that hit very close to home. It was not just professional. That was a personal comment, calling them soft. I mean, to call a grown man soft in a brutal sport. It, it really was a shot across the bow. So I, I they, they they heeded the call, and they came out with intensity, and I love them for that. I want to see it continue against a, a more quality opponent, like maybe next week against the Chiefs. But you can not really criticize much from this effort. I give them a lot of credit. Well, I mean, when a guy like John Elway says that, it means something to the locker room, not just because he's their boss. John Elway played in the National Football League for 16 years, at a Hall of Fame level, won two Super Bowls. He's taken shots. He understands the toughness, both physically and mentally, it takes in order to win in this league. He knows the model. And so when he has to resort to using verbiage such as uh, he did this past week, yeah, it's a shot across the bow, but it's, and it's a bitter pill, but it's one that this team has to swallow. And, you know, you can sit and talk about, oh, John Elway's to blame as well. And I did a, a video over the weekend that went just basically talked about how much, and we've talked about it on the show a lot, but John Elway right. at every pivotal moment post Super Bowl 50 seemingly has made the wrong decision. But he wasn't wrong in what he said this past week. He can't control how the players play on game day. And the previous four games had simply been lackluster and not up to the Denver Broncos standard. And so I think that, yeah, shot across the bow and whatnot, but these guys took it. I think they honestly absorbed it in terms of, you know what, he's not wrong. Let's turn the ship around. Because if you look at how they played the Arizona Cardinals and one of the premier running backs in the NFL, albeit in a terrible offense, albeit on a terrible team, but the Broncos held David Johnson to just 39 yards rushing on 14 attempts. And so coming off of three consecutive games in which they allowed at least 100 yards rushing individually, plus back-to-back 200, I mean, that's saying something, especially being on the road. So, you know, it's it was definitely the type of the shot in the arm that the, the Broncos needed. But let's talk about um, what it means going forward. In fact, before we do that really quick, we got to talk about my bookie. Watching football is fun, but you guys, it is more entertaining when you have some action on the games. Guys, you've heard me talking about this for weeks. Some of you are still on the sidelines, though. Whether you're an expert or a rookie, you should be betting at my bookie. If you're the kind of guy that likes to bet a little and win a lot, like playing the numbers on roulette, you can create a big parlay. Pick three teams to win. If you hit all three, you could turn 100 bucks into $600. There's so much to bet on playoff baseball. You got hockey, primetime fights, NFL, but my bookie is the one bet I know you'll be happy with all year. I recommend these guys because I really trust them. My bookie has been in business for years. They got great online reviews, and their mobile site is easy to use. If you're on the sidelines, now is the time to get in the game. My bookie will still match your first deposit dollar for dollar, but you got to join now because they're going to be pulling that offer. Log on to my bookie right now and double your money. Use promo code HUDDLE. And you'll get your first deposit matched 100%. Use promo code HUDDLE. You play, you win, you get paid. Hey, by the way, Zach. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, Emmanuel Sanders currently, yeah, he's got 158.3 passer rating. Yeah, I tweeted that. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, we let's, let's talk about what it means going forward as far as, you know, week uh, eight at Arrowhead because – Just like we talked about coming out of week four, the Broncos, you know, they had the Chiefs dead to rights, up by 10 points in the fourth quarter, but they couldn't get Patrick Mahomes on the ground. And just like Vance Joseph said coming out of the Rams game, which was very similar uh, to the Chiefs game, there are no moral victories. That, That game in week four did not help Denver in the standings, and it was, you know, uh, the second of what would become four straight losses. But now they go into Arrowhead. And the Chiefs, you know, they're going to play in uh, Week 7 on Sunday. So who knows exactly. We don't know what their schedule is going to be by the time Broncos roll into Arrowhead. But there's a if, if the team, if the Denver Broncos can play with the same type of intensity and emotional edge in which they played the Arizona Cardinals, which was on the road, they'll have to do it again in an extremely tough, 
tough, hostile environment at Arrowhead. But if they play at that same intensity, Zach, all bets are off. I'm not going to go out on a limb right now and by any stretch pick the Denver Broncos to win. But I can see a path to victory for Denver if they play with this same type of emotional and physical intensity that we saw in Week 7. You know, when they played them the first time, I thought their passion and intensity wasn't really a problem. They came out with an excellent game plan. They executed. They confused Mahomes for three and a half quarters of that game. I mean, he took over in the fourth, and that was because the scheme fell apart. But in terms of intensity and passion, that was a home game on a primetime audience, the biggest weekly stage. I thought they were good in that department. I can't extrapolate this performance over the next week because of the quality of opponent. And I'm not going to poo-poo. I'm on this one. Excuse me. It's it's a win to win to win. But this was a, a, a bad Cardinals team. This is probably the worst team in the NFL. And the Chiefs are one of the best teams in the NFL. So, yes, they have to play like they played today. But it's going to take even more than today because the quality of opponent is so much better. They're not facing Josh Rosen. They're, you know, they, they're not facing uh, a bad coaching staff, a rookie coaching staff. They're playing a Super Bowl contender at one of the toughest places to play. If they can bring this swagger and this pissed-off mentality – and this not going to let anyone bully us, we're going to be the bullies, they have a shot. But they have to play complete four quarters of football, totally clean, no mistakes, no turnovers, execute every yard, every yard is paramount. If they can do that, they'll have a chance to win. Will they win? I'm not going to make a prediction just yet. But if, if they can bring like this intensity tonight, that's definitely step one. Step two is executing. So uh, the, hopefully this can springboard them. They have 10 days to get ready for that game. What One thing they cannot do in that time is read their own press clippings, get too high on themselves. It's the worst thing they can do. They have to keep, stay humble. They're still three and four. They're not exactly a contender just yet, and the Chiefs are. So they have to still stay humble, stay hungry, stay motivated. If they can do that, they can bring the mentality they brought today. They have a decent shot. The thing I wrote about after this game in the takeaways piece um, that I do after each and every game is, you know, there's so much to be encouraged by from this performance on Thursday night and trying to kind of translate that or project that into the future and maybe what we what form of this Denver Broncos we can expect to see on the road in Arrowhead. But the biggest thing, not to throw a wet blanket on this, but the biggest thing that makes me doubt that the Broncos are going to be able to harness this energy and this momentum and carry it forward is the quarterback. I still, I I mean, look, a 35-point win on the road is going to quiet all the, you know, the, the Chad Kelly talk, at least internally. But Case Keenum was not good in Arizona. Like, he was average. He was okay. He wasn't terrible. You know, he wasn't bad. But this guy went 14-21, 161 yards. He had that one touchdown, which was underthrown to a wide-open Emmanuel Sanders. And then he had yet another turnover, an interception, which was picked off by uh, Patrick Peterson. And so, so many times watching this game on Thursday night, I saw just from the television broadcast, not, not even the coach's film, just from the television broadcast, plays that Keenum left on the field And I don't know why. I really don't. I mean, he had really good protection for most of the night. He was only sacked twice. The Broncos were very balanced offensively. Uh, Basically, 27 planned runs to 28 planned passes. Okay, It was a great uh, game, I think, for Bill Musgrave. That's the model, especially with the quarterback, with the limitations that Case Keenum has. I mean, that's a a lesson and a, a success model that, Musgrave, Joseph, those guys can't ignore moving forward. Now, I get that Denver's been trailing in the last few games they've been in, so they've that's been out of whack, their balance. I get that. I understand at least the thought process. We've lamented how badly they've been out of whack as far as their pass-to-run ratio. Right. But this is the model. And if you can keep a game within one or two scores, there's no reason to abandon the model that they put in place on Thursday night. But – Again, my expectations, or I'll just say my excitement for this team, is mitigated significantly by the fact that it's Case Keenum. And I still, I know some fans don't want to hear this, a lot do, but I still wonder what this offense would look like. I mean, with how high-powered it is from a talent level at the skill positions, I wonder what this offense would look like with a, 
at least a good, an above average quarterback under center. And, and I still think that Chad Kelly, there's a possibility that he could be that type of quarterback, at least if given a chance that can take advantage of some of the opportunities that Bill Musgrave and these skill position players are presenting to the quarterback, but Keenum's just missing them. You bring up a great point, and I don't want to be too much of a buzzkill or a wet blanket, as you said, but when Von Miller made that comment about kicking the Cardinals' ass, it didn't really impress me. I mean, it's like, like I wrote on Twitter, it's like picking on the smallest, weakest kid on the playground after getting beat up and pummeled by the resident bully. It doesn't really move the needle for me. If they come out and kick the Chiefs' ass, then I'll be impressed. And I want to tell Broncos country one thing about this win. Enjoy it. A win's a win's a win. But this doesn't change any of the problems the Broncos have had. There's still glaring issues with this team. And even though they were covered up, I mean, you're putting lipstick on a pig, essentially, especially with Case Keenum. Again, he held the ball too long. Again, he threw an interception. Again, he didn't really do much to earn his salary or live up to his billing as a potential franchise quarterback. He was average. And in a game where they didn't really need him that much, you can get by. But next week is a different story. They're going to need him to match points with the Chiefs. Mm. And I, I just, I like you, I don't see it with him. I still don't see him as this franchise quarterback. He is above average on his best day. And on his worst day, he's well below average. Nowhere near $18 million a year. A hundred and something yards, a touchdown, and a pick, which was a terrible throw, by the way. Again, his ninth on the year. He doesn't do it for me. So I, I don't want Broncos fans to think that this win changes everything. It really doesn't. It moved them to three and four. It ended a losing streak, but you beat the Cardinals. They're a one-win team that's about to blow up their coaching staff and have a fire sale. They have massive issues they have to resolve, and some on the offensive side of the ball, and it starts with the man under center. And to that point, there's got to be something lingering, I think, with Joseph with his coaching staff and not playing Chad Kelly. I mean, you're up by 35 points in the fourth oh, quarter. I, I know the answer to that. They, don't, they, they could feel the ground swell not just in the fan base, but the media for Chad Kelly over the last three weeks, especially. I mean, it just grew and grew with each week. And they didn't want to feed that by any stretch. They just, they didn't want to give any opportunity for that to, you know, just imagine, like, if he did come in the game, Chad Kelly, all right, set Case Keenan, the Broncos have this well in hand. He comes in, you're going to get a run on first down, a run on second down, but Chad Kelly's going to get a couple of opportunities to throw the ball on third downs. And what if he makes a play? And he looks good, and it'll be that much harder. I mean, the Broncos wanted to completely eliminate that as a talking point coming out of a 35-point win. And if they would have inserted him, it would have rolled the dice on at least the possibility of Chad Kelly looking really good and thus keeping the conversation going, where I don't think it's necessarily a moot conversation at Dove Valley behind closed doors. I think right now it's just they're trying to make as much hay while the sun is shining before the Week 10 bye. And if things aren't looking better from an offensive output perspective and the wins aren't coming as consistently as they like, I still think that there's a chance a a change could be made. But that would be my suspicion why they didn't roll the dice is because they just don't want to feed the the beast, so to speak. I I wrote on Twitter, someone asked me why they're not playing Kelly, and I said they don't want to open a quarterback competition. I was half kidding. If that's the case, that says more about them than than playing them. Yeah. If you're afraid that he's going to go out there and show up your $18 million quarterback, then that $18 million quarterback shouldn't be playing. You have to put the team above one player and not just hide a guy on the bench because of his draft status or because of someone's contract. He was going to come in and throw four touchdowns, but if he can show some incremental progress in a game that counts, or at least a regular season game, then give him the opportunity. He's the backup quarterback for a reason. What if they kept Keenum in the game and Keenum got injured? Then Joseph would have been killed for not playing Chad Kelly. So if they're going to that length to avoid a quarterback competition, that says more about them than even opening up that that topic to begin with. I don't agree with that at all. That is a good point. And but I, I still think it's all it's it's still the truth because I mean Chad Kelly in this offense, you know, here's the thing. Why don't you want to start an inexperienced quarterback? For most teams, especially teams that have some talent like the Denver Broncos do on both sides of the ball. They don't want that inexperience to cost them, especially in terms of turnovers. But their quarterback they're paying $18 million a year is the only quarterback in the NFL that still has turned the ball over at least once in each and every game of the season. So you look at Case Keenum. I think the last I looked, I'm trying to rack my brain, but forgive me if I'm off one or two spots on this, but according to Spot Track, K- 
Case Keenum has the 17th highest quarterback salary in the NFL, if I recall. But going into week seven, he was the 29th ranked quarterback, according to Pro Football Focus, as far as grade, as far as efficiency. Not good. I mean, that's Terrible. a that, that's an out of whack comparison there. You're paying him. I mean, granted, 18 million in today's quarterback market is not top of the mountain. I mean, Kirk Cousins, Jimmy Garoppolo, that's top of the mountain. We understand there's a big difference between 30 plus million and 18, but 18 million for the Denver Broncos is still a lot of money. And if you're the 17th best or you know 17th highest paid quarterback in the NFL, but you're performing like one of the worst three in the in the league. Your team, I mean, at some point, they got to face facts, make some hard decisions, and go, look, next year, it looks like we're going to have, we're going to go to Case Keenum. We're going to say, look, we aren't going to pay you anything more than we're already on the hook for. Are you willing to stick around? We'll keep you on the team as long as you're willing to work at that $7 million that we have to pay you. If not, you're getting the boot. There's the door. And I think Keenum will take it and he'll stay. But the sooner Denver gets to that point, the better. And I know it sounds alarmist because people are like, look, you know, Denver's now three and four. They just got to win. There's there's still an opportunity here for them to make the playoffs. They're still in the hunt. And you're not wrong in that sense. You're not wrong that the Broncos season is far from over. But I am telling you right now, you got the Chiefs next week, then Houston, a more manageable opponent at home, then the bye. That's where you can make some some lasting changes that could really spark your season, such as a quarterback change. Because when you come out of that bye, you have the L.A. Chargers twice. You got the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Cincinnati Bengals, a Cleveland Browns team that is increasingly uh, strong. And then, you know, Oakland. Uh, I might be missing one other one, but it's not an easy schedule coming out of the bye, and the majority of those games are on the road because Denver was favored early this season with so many home games. So I think that it it doesn't necessarily get any easier for the Denver Broncos, which is why going into that Week 10 bye, unless Case Keenan between now and then somehow, you know, turns it around and really elevates his game above and beyond what we've seen in these first seven games, uh, I think the Broncos are fooling themselves if they don't make a change. But I think they're just trying to, you know, limp into the bye as it stands and see what Keenum can do between now and then. Well, what, what strikes me is that they didn't only, you know, they didn't they didn't take out anyone in this game. They were up by multiple possessions. They didn't pull any of their starters. So that says to me that Joseph had a had a plan. It almost seemed like they want to run up the score a little bit. They wanted to mm-hmm. score as many points as possible to show that they're not this laughing stock. And that's it's good and bad. That's kind of unprofessional to say, you know, and it's also they want to impose their will. Yeah, but this is not an elite team. If they do this against the Chiefs, then I'll be impressed. And my point about Case Keenum, yeah, they save money on him, $18 million a year, but they didn't do any other thing to supplement that position. They didn't trade for a backup. They didn't sign another uh, you know, capable veteran. Kevin Hogan doesn't count. They didn't draft one. They pass on Rosen and Allen. It's just they put all their eggs in the Case Keenum basket, and they're not getting the Vikings Keenum anything close to that. They're getting that journeyman Keenum. And I don't have any faith that he's going to come out over the last – in the second half of the schedule and lead them to the playoffs. Yeah. If you look at me right now at three and four, I don't see a playoff team. I see they had a good win against a really bad team, but it does not cover up or exonerate them from the losses they had. It doesn't. To get blown up by the Jets and and to lose these close games against the Rams and to lose against the Ravens, those are more quality opponents, even the Jets are. And they face a tough schedule. I mean, like you said, all those opponents, are they, they beat the Broncos. I thought the Cardinals had no chance today, and they showed that. But I just don't look at the Broncos right now at 3-4 and four with Case Keenum as their quarterback mm. and see a playoff team. I just don't see it. I think if the Broncos ride this Keenum thing out because, you know, we paid him the money, so let's just get as much out of this as we can, I think they're pushing it even trying to get to 8-8. Eight and eight. I mean, yes, looking I at this schedule as it remains – the Broncos currently sit with three wins. I have a hard time seeing five more wins <laughs> on the schedule with Case Keenum under center. So, and again, I, you know, we don't want to throw a wet blanket on this thing because it, it was a great win, and you want to celebrate as Broncos fans and feel good about your team taking care of business in a get-right game, like a, a, a good team at least, or at least a capable, competent team is supposed to do. So far, be it from us to take away from that, but just looking ahead and some of the implications. Case Keenum was, I mean, 
He just wasn't that good on a, on a, on the road against a team in which he had every opportunity in the world to just light it up. And the one thing I, I will say, um, I don't know if you noticed this, Zach, but Royce Freeman didn't touch the ball from about seven minutes into the third quarter on. He didn't. He I don't know if he's banged up. I didn't catch. Yeah, he has an ankle injury. Does he? Okay, so yeah. that's the only change I really noticed. To your point. Um, late in the game when the Broncos had this thing handily, you know, it was game over basically, was I didn't see Freeman. So uh, hopefully he can, uh, you know, get right in time for the for the Chiefs game because he's got basically a mini bye week. Uh, that's one of the – that's the one benefit of playing on Thursday night. So hopefully he can capitalize on that and move forward. But just a couple things to touch on before we get out of here. Again, we're keeping this one short. Uh, We're going to come back to you next week, either Monday or Tuesday, maybe Wednesday at the latest, but Zach and I are going to come back and do another episode uh, before the Chiefs game. But I just want to touch on some of the uh, guys who produced at a particularly high level. we got to talk about the fact that Von Miller and Bradley Chubb continue to go on this epic tear because I think Joe Woods finally pulled his head out, so to speak, and he's going, look, I'm overthinking this. You know, I'm I'm having Von Miller and Bradley Chubb at times drop back into coverage on third downs, trying to confuse my opponent. I'm just getting too cute. I need to just let these guys do what they do best, pin their ears back, get after the quarterback. Von Miller was a freaking menace this entire game. Finished with two sacks, uh, two forced fumbles, and Bradley Chubb also two sacks and one forced fumble. Both of Miller's Force fumbles were recovered by the Broncos, one of which by your boy, Demarcus Walker, the living legend himself. Yes. Um, but Bradley Chubb's forced fumble was was ultimately recovered by Rosen. But got to love what you're seeing from that vision that Elway had, at least, in passing on Rosen to take Chubb at pick five came to fruition last week, and they were able to parlay that into back-to-back weeks of both guys really eating. Let me give a shout out real quick to Demarcus Walker, and I'm not his agent or anything close to it, but he comes in, he's been inactive every single week, he recovers a fumble, he makes a couple tackles, great game for him, Um, he needs to be active every single week, and it took an injury and six weeks into the season for him to get active, hopefully it stays that way. But the Broncos do what they do best when they have a lead, and they so rarely do. They so rarely get an opponent where the opponent has to pass, and the opponent can't dictate the game flow. They they came from behind the Cardinals. Rosen was dropping back almost every snap. That's why David Johnson was pretty much a non-factor. This is what the Broncos envision now. Rush the passer, let Von Miller do what he does best, and having Bradley Chubb frees up Von Miller, less double teams, less triple teams, less chip blocks, and that's why you're seeing Miller now. He leads the NFL in sacks. He leads the NFL in forced fumbles. He said a couple weeks ago, amid his dry spell, that sacks come in bunches, and sure enough, he was right. The last couple weeks, he has turned it on, and I think reestablished himself as the game's premier pass rusher with respect to Khalil Mack. This is what you want to see from this Denver defense, and that's why, to me, it felt like a throwback of the 2015 defense. Creating turnovers, sacking the quarterback, scoring points on defense to help out the offense and and make this game and just take it out of the the opponent's hands. Mm. This is what they want to see, and this is what Joe Woods, to his credit, he has realigned himself and not dropping Miller back so much, not dropping Bradley Chubb back, which was ludicrous to begin with. you got to get them rushing the passer. And some part of me thinks the Broncos are better off in a 4-3 scheme just to have Walker play his natural spot, Bradley Chubb play with his hand in the dirt. But they're succeeding right now, and I would not change anything. I keep blitzing, I keep rushing the passer, and hopefully the offense can help them out because they play with a lead and this defense can be deadly. There's a model here on both sides of the ball that if the Broncos can duplicate it, I mean, it's it's – it's a model for success, and I, and I hope it's not lost on the coaching staff. But to your point about Demarcus Walker, look, from the majority of his career as a Bronco, he's been a healthy scratch. But when he's been on the field in the regular season, he makes plays. Every time. Let's talk about a model again. That's a model. You want to duplicate your successes. It's It cannot be lost on this coaching staff. I mean, it was, you know, he was, he was, when someone recovers a fumble, it's like half of that's luck, being in the right place at the right time. Half of it's being opportunistic and having great situational awareness and just, you know, just being there. Some guys have a knack. Demarcus Walker has a knack for being around the ball and getting after the passer. And maybe, you know what, moving forward, we know what his limitations are. So you don't put him on the field, maybe on first or second down 
when you expect a high percentage probability of a run. But in third down and obvious passing situations, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't have this playmaker on the field. And then two other guys want to give a shout out to Bradley Roby stepped up big time, dropped an interception, got an interception. Good for him. Big bounce back game. He was solid last week after giving up the two big plays early in the game to the Rams, but then kind of steadied as the game progressed. This was a massive bounce back game for Bradley Roby in terms of building his confidence and getting him back into the kind of mental headspace that he needs to be in. Then the other guy, we've been crucifying him all season long and for damn good reason. But Todd Davis was an animal, a freaking animal on Thursday night. Finished the game with 10 tackles. He had that interception return for a touchdown. I tipped my cap to him. Yeah, he had uh, six uh, solo stops too. I mean, he led the team in tackles. He has not been good to this point. I've been, and you and I both have been among his bigger critics. But today, I think, was his better game. One of his best games in a Broncos uniform. I can't recall a better one in the last couple of years, especially. Um, he was knocking players over. I mean, he was quick, sideline to sideline. Decent in pass coverage, even stopping the run. I mean, that's what you want to see. That's why they brought him back. And I got to give him credit. Credit where credit's due. He played a great game. Bradley Roby, one thing that is not a coincidence is that I noticed the Broncos were playing a lot more man coverage tonight. And that is his strength. He is not a zone coverage cornerback, and he struggled with that. He needs to be on the line of scrimmage running with his receiver. And again, he faced a rookie quarterback. This is not a good offense that he played, so you got to take that into consideration. But he has definitely settled down. And that's key for this Broncos secondary because he's been getting roasted. I mean, he allowed the most yards and receptions and the highest reception rate among all Broncos corners up until this game. So for him to have a bounce back game, great for his confidence, great for Todd Davis, who's been kind of getting pushed by Josie Jewell a little bit. Those are two veterans that had rookies underneath them pushing for their jobs. And they kind of took it back, I think. So yeah. um, the entire, I mean, the entire team, I really, there was no bad performance today. And I'm just calling it like it is. All the, the 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 much maligned players, they stepped up. The stars balled out. I mean, it was just a dominating win. And opponent, it can be as lackluster as the Cardinals were, but you got to give your the credit where credit's due. Here's what I love about Chris Harris. You know, he had his he was great against the pass. He had his pick six, and he still finished third on the team with six tackles, five of which were solo. So he's just a guy that has you know he, he got burned a couple times early in the season on those two touchdowns. Um, in back-to-back weeks to to open the season but since then he has been money and he was just a pleasure to watch play football on Thursday night yet again at Arizona but hey look if there's anything to take away from this game it's that Emmanuel Sanders has a quarterback rating of (laughs) 158.3 put that man in the Pro Bowl shoot I mean maybe the Broncos need to talk about Emmanuel Sanders playing quarterback at this point I mean Passer rating at being as important as it is, you know, we can't overlook that. But another huge game for him, last thing I want to talk about, is Sanders had 130 yards basically from scrimmage when you factor in. Well, actually, yeah, 130 yards from scrimmage. 102 as a receiver, caught six balls on seven targets plus a touchdown, which went for 64 yards. And then his pass that thankfully was hauled in by a, a leaping Cortland Sutton with that massive catch radius because uh, it was a little high, but Sanders also had that touchdown pass, so tip your cap to him as well. Um, but Demarius Thomas, I, I just think, too, that uh, Keenum, this 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 is another example of Keenum falling short of the mark because this wide receiver core, I mean, to say nothing of the depth the Broncos have a running back and the playmakers in the backfield, their receivers are better than what their statistical output has shown through the the first seven games of the season because the quarterback is not distributing the ball uh, and putting these guys in the best position to succeed and really raising all ships like truly good quarterbacks do. Cortland Sutton was targeted three times, had one reception, and it came from, of course, Emmanuel Sanders, thankfully, for a touchdown. Demarius Thomas targeted six times, five receptions, 42 yards, a long of 12. So, I think it's more it's incumbent the onus is on Case Keenum to find a way, I think, to get Demarius Thomas more involved in this game because when he's touched the ball, especially the last four games, he's found a way to make an impact. And even tonight against the Cardinals, you know, kind of a quiet outing for him. But I think Case Keenum needs to find a way to get him more involved because he can still make plays. Get your tinfoil hats ready. The Broncos gave Emmanuel Sanders a pass attempt and not Chad Kelly. 
So that says it all. <laughs> no, but uh, Demarius Thomas, the point of him, if you put him on the Rams, let's say, or the Patriots, mm. he is a lot better than what he's doing this season with a better quarterback and a better scheme. And one thing that I saw on Twitter is that Chris Harris Jr. was talking to Larry Fitzgerald after the game, and Fitzgerald said to him, you guys are a lot better than your record indicates. Mm. And what does that scream to you? That is coaching and quarterbacking. It's the production of your players and the scheme of the coaches. The offense should not be this stagnant. Demarius Thomas is, he's older, yes. I mean, he's not what he once was, but he's still very, very capable. And he, he could still score touchdowns. You put him on a better offense with a Tom Brady or a Jared Goff, Aaron Rodgers, he is having a thousand yard season easily. So, again, it points to Case Keenum not being that franchise quarterback because when you are, you raise, like you said, the talent around you. You make everyone around you better. That's why Tom Brady has won with nobody's at receiver for so long. He makes everyone around him better. He can turn you or I into a Pro Bowl receiver. Case Keenum can't do that. He has good chemistry with Emmanuel Sanders, yes. Um, he's getting Cortland Sutton going, but it, the, the result was Demarius Thomas became a non-factor, and it shouldn't be. They should have all those receivers firing at full speed. He hasn't been injured. He's been healthy, in good shape. He should be contributing more. And if they had a better quarterback, they'd have a better passing attack. So um, I think this is Demarius' last year. I get this question a lot on Twitter, on Facebook. I don't think he'll be traded this in between now and the 30th. I do think this is last year in Denver, though. I mean, it's yeah. obviously not his offense anymore. This is Cortland Sutton's team. Emmanuel, I think, will, will be brought back for another oh, year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's super explosive. It's a career year for him. Very reinvigorated year. I do think Thomas is gone, though. Yeah. There's too many mouths to feed, and they not enough scraps to go around. Um, it's just someone had to go, and I think uh, Thomas will draw the short stick next offseason. Well, if it isn't apparent, you guys listen to the show tonight. We're completely stoked that the Denver Broncos snapped their losing streak. They're back on the winning track. We'll see how long that can last. But both Zach and I, we've been off the Case Keenum train now for a couple of weeks. We just don't see it. Nope. And if there's anything that's going to hold this team back, aside from you know coaches being continuing to prove their prowess week in and week out, it's just lackluster, lackluster, I should say, quarterback play from Case Keenum. But, hey, that's all the time we got for tonight. We're, we're pulling a late shift here to get you this podcast, to get you through the weekend. Zach and I will be back. We'll come back early next week, uh, probably Tuesday, Monday, I don't know, either Monday or Tuesday, yeah. uh, to, to drop some knowledge. We'll probably have a little bit more information coming out of this game, and then we'll also look ahead a little bit towards the Chiefs game and uh, project our thoughts and, and what we see happening ultimately in week eight but make sure you're following the show on twitter at huddle up pod follow zach on twitter at kelberman 24 7 myself at chad and jensen and you guys smash the subscribe button make sure you're doing that you're not going to want to miss a single episode because lord knows where this Broncos season is going to go and you just you don't want to miss it for zach kelberman i'm chad jensen we'll talk to you soon You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.